In recent years, we've had a mini trend in which German publishers use English language names on their games, even if the game doesn't include rules in the English language. I assume this is for simplicity's sake when licensing a game to publishers in other countries, or perhaps just reaching out to gamers and trying to get them to look at a game anyway, because it sounds familiar and you assume that the translated rules will show up on BoardGameGeek at some point. But then there are other publishers, other German publishers, that go the other way and just deutsch the hell out of their game name because it sounds awesome to them, and I suppose it expresses something that can't be expressed in English. This happens a lot with Zockverlag, which has game names that are inevitably puns and moreover alliterative puns, and they just express something in just a few words that is perfect. And then they try to translate them into English, and it seems like it gets lost along the way. But for the German audience, it's ideal. So we have another example of that with the Schmidt Spiele title, Man muss auch gunnen können, which I am sure I am not saying correctly because every German I have said this to laughs. I just can't get the gunnen können, gunnen können, man muss auch gunnen können. I can try. I can get close, perhaps. Even the translation of this title doesn't seem to exist in English. Different people have expressed it something along the lines of, you must be nice to people and give them something even if you don't want to. I don't know if that's exactly the right spirit, but that's what I get out of it. It's kind of the opposite of schadenfreude. Instead of laughing at someone's misfortune, you must give them something nice, even if you don't want to. Seems like the reverse. Uh, an English translation I've seen Schmidt use in referring to the game is play nice with the dice. That also gives the spirit of the game with a little rhyming aspect to it, something that everyone loves in publishing. So what is this actual game? Well, it's a one to four player roll and write game. It's a bit of a combo-driven game, similar to Ganz schon clever and Doppelt so clever, two other titles in Schmidt Spiele's Klein and Fine line of tiny games. They are also combo-driven roll-and-write games. Gunnen Kunnen, Mademoiselle Gunnen Kunnen has that same thing going on for one to four players. It's quite involved and combo-driven and a little tough to wrap your head around initially. Let's look at it. Here are the components in Man Musau Kunin Kunin. We have a set of four scoring cards you use at the end of the game to add up your score. Whoever gets dealt this one at random will be the starting player. You give one of these to each player. You give a pen to each player. You have the box, which you will use to show which dice are still in play and which ones have been set aside. You have decks of scoring cards and bonus cards. Each player gets dealt two of these at random at the start of the game. They keep three of these four, shuffling the one they don't take into the deck that's appropriate. And you arrange these cards in some manner in front of you so they're touching. And your goal over the course of the game is to add more cards to your display and create a 3x3 three three grid, ideally scoring lots of points. But to score points, you must activate the card and ideally meet some condition on the card that will enable you to score. And we'll talk more about the details of scoring in a little bit, as well as what these bonuses do. They will help you score and help you complete cards. The active player for the turn is going to roll all five dice, and they then can do one of two things, or they will be forced to re-roll. So if I have rolled a three of a kind, I can purchase either of these two bonuses or these two scoring cards. You'll notice the three of a kind symbol here. On your own table at home, you will probably have this market displayed horizontally, but I want everything to fit my frame and make it as large as possible. So vertical it is. If I have a four of a kind, I can buy any of these, but I don't. I can use dice to complete a card. That is to fill in every empty space. I can't fill in a card partially, I must fill it in entirely. But you'll notice I have only five dice in play, and this card has eight spaces, and this has seven, and this has a somewhat difficult straight to acquire with one to five with a pink three in the middle. I do not have that, and I cannot do the other two, and I cannot buy a card. So I can put aside as many dice as I wish, and then re-roll. Normally re-rolling is a good thing, but whenever you re-roll, the opponents get to use one of the dice that you re-roll. So if one of my opponents were to have, say, this card here, they could choose to write a pink two in there, and that will help them 
towards the completion of this card. This card has two pinks on it. You clearly cannot complete that in one roll since there is only one pink die. So they need to fill in the pink at some point and then get another pink later. And of course this has seven dice on it anyway. So I can stop if I wish because I have three fives and I can purchase a card. Or if I want, I can roll again. Maybe I'm trying for a card up here or I want to do something else. As for example's sake, I'll roll this. Now my opponents can use a pink one and a yellow six. So maybe this person who had a pink two here now has a yellow six here. And then now they know what they need to match on these cards. Of course, if you had this one, I don't think I rolled a three or a four. That would be useless for you. If I ro if you had this card over here, I had set the orange aside. So you could not use the orange anyway. Not that you'd want a five in it, but you have nothing to work with. So at the end of my turn, I can use these three dice to buy a card. If I did not have a three of a kind, let's say I ended up with something like this, I cannot buy a card, I cannot complete a card by filling in all the empty spaces. I can use exactly two dice, sorry, up to two dice, and fill those spaces in on my board. So perhaps I want to use this yellow six here, since I need eight dice that sum to 40, and this one has two blues. That's going to take a while to complete. Let's get one of the blues out of the way. Now the next player goes. Now they're going to roll. They are trying to do something. Maybe they set these aside to buy a card and they roll something else. And they've rolled this and now I get to use one of these. Hmm. I don't have a pink three. These numbers are all low. I don't want them here. I can just start here. Or maybe I just go with a two. Now they buy something and they're done. Player three rolls. And they get something like this. Maybe they have this card. Or maybe they have this one right here. Fine. Oh, I get to use one of these. Again, no pink three. All low numbers. Maybe I work towards this. They roll again. I say, fine. I'll do another five here. Now I have only five empty spots, so potentially I can complete this on my next turn. We come up to my next turn. I roll, I've got a four. I don't have a three, don't have a one. Hmm, the yellow and blue, and these are all low. Put this aside. And again, the opponents can use this. Oh, it's the wrong color. These are high numbers but do I have high enough to get this? 10, 15, 20, 32, 39, almost enough. Hmm. Let's give it one go here. Ah! And then, so I have to do something else. So what am I trying to do? Well, I'm trying to complete these scoring patterns on the top of the card in order to activate a card. And if I did somehow magically roll the number I needed here, I could mark off this six and then a four, six, five, six, and then I can activate this card. This card will be worth 22 points as long as I have a card of each of the five colors in my display. So now I have a reason for what I wanna buy over the course of the game. This card is now full, so now I can only work on these two cards during other players' turns when I can possibly buy dice. What do these cards do? Let's talk a little bit more about scoring conditions because that will affect what you're trying to do in the game. So this card here, if I get a row or column that is all the same color, I get 12 points, which is why I put these two blue here. Ideally, I can purchase another blue and put it on either side and now I'll get 12 points. Maybe I'll have a green row as well. But I score those points only if I activate those card, that card, which means I need a four of a kind and a three of a kind with these sort of color restrictions in order to activate that. Right now, this is worthless, as is this one. This card here is six points for each horizontal row or vertical column in which you have activated all the cards in that row or column. That's what that check mark means. This one here is eight points for each yellow card that's adjacent to it. Doesn't matter whether that yellow is activated or not. I just need the yellow next to it. Four points for each pink, six points for each horizontally, or sorry, orthogonally adjacent card that is activated. 
Hmm, but I need to activate this as well in order to score it. This combination, though, is slightly easier than this one. Maybe? It's hard to tell sometimes when you're looking at these until you start to play and you see what you're pairing them with. So this one over here, you need a four number straight with green being the lowest number. And this lets you use a die three times during the game as a color of your choice. So once I have filled, if I own this card and I've filled it in and I activate this, now I get three uses of this card in order to change the dice as I wish. So on a future turn, should I roll a three, I can now mark off this and I make this a pink three instead of the three there. But of course I would also need a four in order to complete this card. So many restrictions. This bonus over here, again, I have to complete this straight in order to activate it. And I get three uses during the game where I can adjust the value of a die up or down by one but you cannot have six wrapper on the one. That does not work in this game. Three times you get to use that. This one as well, if I get this four of a kind with a green five, I get to three times during the game, take one additional die during another player's turn. So if another player rolls and they get something I really want, maybe I just want to go ahead, maybe they roll this, and I really want three there and a three there in order to work on this four of a kind, I can mark off one of the spaces here and use an extra die from the opponent. But of course, I must acquire this card first and get a four of a kind in order to activate it. This card can be the color of your choice, which is great for completing this sort of bonus or this scoring bonus or this bonus or this bonus. If you get the straight here, you can activate the card and at the end of the game, you choose which color you want it to be. The fifth bonus type is this one here, again, activate it. And then when I purchase new cards from here, I can purchase it for one die less for each space I mark off. So if I roll and I get this where it's only two of a kind, I can mark this off and now I have a three of a kind or mark it twice and I have a four of a kind, I can buy whatever I want. So those are the five types of bonuses. There are a few other scoring conditions as well, which I thought I had seated at the top of the deck and now I don't find it all. Let's give another example from a completed game, which I'll talk about in a moment. This one here, for each different type of activated bonus you have in your grid, you get five points. So you must activate this card in addition to activating the bonuses themselves, which you will probably wanna do in order to get those points. So you have tons of things going on and tons of possibilities for what you can connect together in order to score. But there's a lot of work involved in terms of getting things together, putting them in the right order, getting the numbers you need, activating them, and then seeing how to use bonuses smartly. And you're racing until someone gets nine cards in their grid. When someone does that, you complete that round and then you have one more entire round as both active player and passive player for how many players there are. And then the game ends. Anything you have not filled in by that time is going to give you no points. So do your best to fill everything in to maximize your score. There is an overview of Ben Mosaut Kunin Kunin, which I hope gives you some sense of how to play. At heart, it's a very simple, straightforward game like many roll and write games. You're gonna roll dice, you're gonna mark things off, you're gonna score points. That's the simple base level, but it never works that way because of the restriction in which you cannot stop re-rolling unless you can acquire a card or complete a card or even both. You can do both on the same turn should you happen to get a three of a kind and then you can use the remaining two dice in order to complete a card or even two cards. Or perhaps you have the bonus which lets you buy a card for two and then you have three dice that let you complete something. Maybe you manipulate the value of one, you change the color of one in order to get everything working the right way. And it feels really good when you're able to make that happen. Similar to how it feels in Ganshun Clever when you are able to pick a die and then get a bonus and trigger off something else and do something else and line everything up. And it just cascades from that point. And Men Musa Gunungkunen has that same aspect where Things feel slow initially, especially when you look at your starting cards and you have things you cannot complete. 
that may affect the choice of what you want to start with so that I can get something that I can complete immediately, especially one of the bonuses, so then I can have that to help propel me into the future. But that won't necessarily happen, and the dice may not cooperate. You have a lot of luck in the dice in terms of what's coming up, but you do have many rounds in the game. I've played six times now, and games tend to range, I don't know, 12, 15, 20 rounds. I have not tracked them completely, but I think it's at least 15 rounds, depending on how things work out. Solo game I played turn out shorter. But you have many, many rounds where you are forced to reroll many times, which gives the other player bonuses. But of course, they're doing that to you, and you're sort of picking off things one at a time. And ideally, it all works out where you're putting things together the right way, and you were setting yourself up for smart plays. It doesn't always work, because the dice don't cooperate. So maybe you go for more bonuses, but that means you're not getting the scores. There's so many different ways to pull things together. You're somewhat at the mercy of the dice, of course, along with the mercy of how the cards come out and what your opponents are buying and what they are doing. So as you're playing, as I try to give a sense during the game, I'm looking to see what I can complete at a particular time so that I can end up scoring points or using the bonus that I complete. But if I don't acquire new cards and I just complete cards, then I have nothing to mark off on on the other players' turns when they are active players. And this varies a lot depending on a two, three, and four player game. With four players, of course, I'm getting a lot more turns where I can potentially use dice from other people. So I wanna make sure that I am acquiring cards more quickly so that I can then mark them off on other people's turns. It doesn't happen quite as much with two players. So I've played six times so far, one solo, once with four, once with three, uh, a few times with two, all on a review copy from Schmidt Spiele. So the game, changes depending on the player count, but you still have that aspect where you're trying to balance acquiring new cards in order to get combinations that work for you, scoring possibilities that work for you, bonuses that can help you, while also not getting too many cards because I don't want to rush and fill my grid because as soon as someone has a three, three by three grid that's complete, we're gonna trigger the end of the game and have one finish that round and then have one more complete round. So you kind of need to rush to get the cards that are going to work together as best as possible, but you don't really wanna rush because then you may find yourself wasting turns, doing nothing. I'm rolling something and I roll a three of a kind and I could acquire a card, but that's gonna be the ninth card. I don't need that, but I also don't need what I rolled. So now I have to just roll lots of things in order to give people more chances to take dice from me. Ideally, ideally, you were gonna be rolling and you roll that three of a kind exactly when you need it. Or I have the bonus that lets me buy something for less or manipulate something. So I have that three of a kind and I have one roll and no one else profits off re-rolls from me. Or I've set myself up by marking things on other players' turns and now I roll and I get exactly the two dice I need. I complete the card and I'm done. And again, no one mooches. You're trying to set yourself up so that you can do that repeatedly, but it's difficult to do because the things that have the most points are typically the cards with more complicated things to complete, such as a three of a kind with a color restriction and a four of a kind, or a straight, where, or not straight, you have card five spaces that have to be the lowest, next lowest, third lowest, so on and so forth. So really you need one to five or one to six in some manner of missing a die. You know what I mean. You've played enough games. They have these complicated restrictions for how you do things and so you can try to rush the end of the game, but of course you have to score at the same time. So you're trying to combo everything together. Can I get that fifth color? Can I just focus on one color? Can I line them up and then get the bonus that rewards me for lining them up and activate that card as well. So it's all these things sort of sparking together and trying to pull them together in the right way. So it's, it's challenging, it's difficult to do. And I don't think it's just luck based. I don't know, maybe, maybe it is. And I've just somehow magically won all five of my competitive games just luckily or maybe there's something to it and I'm just putting things together better than other people. I don't know. 
maybe maybe it works out that way. I'm not really sure. Again, five games. Is that a good sample pool? Maybe? I, it's hard to say because, of course, then I teach the game to other people, but I have experience, and so I can kind of see how I want to fit things together and what cards I want to take and which patterns I don't want to pair together because I don't want to be working on those at the same time. It's a little complicated to mix all that together. So and aside from the com competitive play, there is a solo mode where you are taking turns as active and passive player. It's fairly straightforward. I've got a completed game, so I'll show you what that looks like once you're done. Here's the layout for my completed solo game of Men Musak Gunun Kunin, which will look very much like a completed game with opponents as well, because you are trying to complete a 3x3 grid, trying to activate everything if possible, which I did in this case with some lucky die rolls and a little die manipulation at the end of the game. I started with these three cards, which gave me goals for what I want to try to do. I want to surround this and activate all of those cards in order to maximize that score. I want to get different bonuses and activate them. I put two blue in here. Here's a bonus to work with, and it's got some die manipulation. And then I built on slowly over time. I picked up yellow. I started putting yellow in a row, possibly trying to get something that would score when I have three cards of the same color in a row, such as this card right here. I ended up not getting one of those. Instead, I ended up getting the five color one, along with a second scoring card for different bonuses. And this one, which scores for yellow, which I was working towards at the bottom for the other purpose. So it all kind of, kind of came together in the same way. How the solo game works is you take a turn as active player like normal, you roll the dice, if I can't complete something and I can't buy something, I put the things aside, I must roll again until either I can complete a card, have acquired a card, or I've rolled three times. And then I can use the two dice like normal, or I can take a card at random from the top of the deck and add it to my display. After that, I take a passive turn and I roll the dice for the passive player and the number of dice I can mark off depends on how many rolls I had in my initial active turn. If I took only one turn, then I get to use three of these dice. If I ended up taking three rolls, I use only one die. So again, you have an incentive to be able to stop as quickly as possible because then I can use more dice on the passive turn to mark things off. And yet again, I need to be able to have things that I can mark off. If I don't have anything to mark off, then it doesn't matter how quickly I, I end my turn. So after taking the active turn and the passive turn, you discard one card at the end of the market, either the scoring card or the bonus card here. You throw it away, slide everything down, turn over a new card and continue. Now that card that you throw away keeps track of your turns because on a level one game, you have at most 15 turns. So take an active turn, a passive turn, throw away a card. If you have finished 15 turns, you are done. If you complete your grid, as in this case, you finish that round and then have one, one more complete round, just like a game with opponents, and then you tally your score. The target score in this case is 90, and by chance, if you look at this, this all adds up to exactly 90. So I wasn't really planning for that. It just magically worked out where I did that one completely and had the three bonuses and so forth and so on. 90 points, done. Level two, I'll get one fewer round, but the point total is a bit lower. The rules suggest after you just start whatever level you want and you try all these different levels. Obviously, you might want to start with one just to get more experience and see how things get put together. As you progress through time, you'll have fewer and fewer rounds. And once you've won all of these levels at least once, then you can start a campaign. And with a campaign, you start at level one, you play, if you get 90 or more points, great, you go to level two. If you get 86 points or more, great, you go to level three. If you fail level two, then you have to start over again at level one. Ooh. If you get more than 90 points, you can record the extra and you can apply those points to a later level. So you can carry over the points from one level to another one in order to meet that target. 
which drops over the course of the game, but it's much harder with fewer rounds in order to get that point total. There's a run through of the solo game, which I've tried only once, only a level one game. I'm not much for solo gaming, just not to my taste. It feels a little different, mostly because I can use more dice as a passive player if I take only one turn as the active player. But of course, the passive player rolls something and I don't need any of those dice, or I need only one, then it doesn't matter that I get to take three of those dice. So it's a different additional consideration to consider when trying to decide what you want to do on your turn, what you are trying to complete. Can you even take advantage of what the other player rolls? So I had one card that lets me raise or lower die, use that, had something that lets you change color, that was helpful as well in completing these scoring cards and activating them and trying to go for all those points. So it works, it feels very similar to the regular game, but of course, you lose that aspect of the regular game where Dan repeatedly rolls once and then uses all his dice or acquires something and it's just done. And you're just like, Dan, why are you thwarting us again? He's just, he's not cooperating and giving us what we need. He is not playing nice with the dice. He is not uh, kunen kunaing or whatever it might be. You're not doing that. So you really lose that element of the competitive play and sort of sticking it to the neighbors and, and sort of like cheering people on like, yes, you want to reroll again. You don't want to buy that card. You want to do that. You want to try to get that bonus so that you can try to score off what they're doing. And of course, scoring off what they're doing, you have to take that in mind on your turn for which dice you're going to set aside. Someone really needs an orange three and you just like, I'm just going to set aside that orange die. Uh, I had two twos. I could have chosen either one, but of course I want the orange one. So... I don't help you as much. Still not playing nice, but playing according to the rules. It's a fascinating combo roll and write involved game by Ulrich Bloom and Jens Merkel. It's very, it's, it's fascinating to see this much going on with these simple components. But of course, we sort of worked our way up to this level. The roll and write game did not start at this level. You know, this combo driven game that will possibly frustrate you as much as it fascinates you but ideally you can play and find yourself making smart plays and being like yes that's what this game was made for smart plays can i do it